Matthew chapter 1. There was a lady who um, was behind on her Christmas shopping, and so she uh, made her way to the mall. Uh, She found herself tired of the traffic, uh, tired of the lines, tired of the crowds. She was tired of rushing down an aisle only to find the toy that she was after been sold out for a couple days. So with an armload of presents, she made her way to the uh, mall elevator. Uh, Her arms were full when the elevator doors opened. The elevator was full. Uh, She grumbled as she stepped in. They grumbled as they moved aside to allow a little bit of room for her. As the doors shut, she found herself saying way too loud, I don't know who is responsible for this Christmas thing, but they ought to be arrested, tied up, and shot. Um, Most of the people on the elevator grumbled in agreement, except for someone in the back corner. From the back corner, you hear this voice that said, they've already done that. You know, the, the thing about that story is it reminds me of two things. One, we have a tendency to forget the meaning of Christmas, what Christmas is all about. We have this tendency to forget the meaning of Christmas when the truth is what Christmas is all about is not presents. It really is about the Lord Jesus. And that's why I'm thankful for the birth narratives, the stories that surround the birth of Jesus Christ, because those stories remind me what Christmas is all about. Those stories uh, tell me what I should think when it comes to Christmas. You'll remember last week we looked at one of those stories. It was the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. It was a story of faith that reminded us that when we think about Christmas, we should think not only are we saved by faith, but we live by faith. This week I want us to look at a second story. And this story isn't about faith. This story really is about presence, the presence of God. And in this story, we'll be reminded that God is seen in his son. If you want to know what God is like, then look at the Lord Jesus. That's where God reveals himself. So Matthew writes this story about Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. What is that story intended to say to us? Matthew answers that question in verse 22 when he says, All this took place. Here's the reason. All this took place to fulfill what God said through the prophet. Then he quotes Isaiah 7 in verse 14. Where Isaiah wrote, The virgin will conceive, give birth to a son. and They will call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. What does that mean? God with us. I mentioned a little bit ago that that those three words can mean a variety of things. God with us. But I think in this context, what Matthew is trying to communicate is presence. That Jesus was God with us. In that, not only was he divine, but it's through Christ that God is revealing his nature to the world. Uh, that's what John hints at in John chapter 1. There he says it this way. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in close relationship with the Father, he has made him known. God with us, at least in part, means that when you look at Jesus, you find out what God is like. You see God. God is seen in his son. One theologian explained it this way. He says, we man, men cannot go up into heaven and see what God is like. No one has seen God at any time. Yet, through, yet though no one from here could go there, one from there could come down here. And one did. On that first Christmas, God the Son entered into human life. And by sojourning here, he made God the Father known. God is seen in his 
son. So if you look at the life of Christ, you can find out what God is like. If you look at the birth of Christ, you can find out what God is like. Well, what are the circumstances that surround the birth of Jesus Christ? I've invited Joseph, who was there that day, to tell us the story. Joseph. Thank you. Uh, I like this idea of, of two services. Our services go hours on and they last all day. And we don't get to switch teams and have a new group. So it's nice to see a new face. In the early service, I met a man named Mike Howard. <laughs> the early service had the same reaction. Mike had told me that he would come up and take my place to tell the story today if I needed him to, but I don't see Mike anywhere. He's disappeared. Perhaps my good friend Hayden, if I need some help, maybe you can come up and help me out, right, buddy? <laughs> maybe not. Well, I tell you, I'm so grateful that you have me here today. You see, where I am from, a small town, I am not often welcomed by my family and friends. Uh, I'm from a small farming community, uh, one where uh, there's maybe 400, 500 people, a place where everyone knows the news before it is published. Anyone from a small town like that? <laughs> then you know Nazareth. You see, uh, in this small town, it seems like everyone knows everyone else's business. And you must travel at least four miles by foot to get to any other neighboring community with supplies. So naturally, when I was a young man, 25 years of age, it was difficult to find a young, eligible woman to marry. But I found one. <laughs> and her name was Mary. Hmm. See, in my culture, at 25 years of age, a man would marry a woman, uh, not uncommon, um, 15 or 16 years. But what do I say to a young lady? So naturally, I, I go ask my father. And, and I say to him, Father, I, I want to wed Mary. And he says, yes. And the next day, we go to Mary's house. And unbeknownst to me, Mary had been speaking with her parents as well. Yes. <laughs> I assume that gesture means the same in your culture as it does in mine. So we go to Mary's house and I wait outside. And my father goes in and he speaks to Mary's father as well. And they have some general mundane conversation. How's the family? How's the farm? This weather is so hot. But then I hear my father say, My son, your daughter. Mary's father is reluctant at first, but he agrees. The two men speak of the dowry, and then I am invited inside. And when I come in, they pour a single glass of wine. And that is when I see Mary. I take a drink, and then Mary takes a drink from the exact same cup. And in that moment, I am engaged to the most beautiful woman in the world. In our culture... Um, Although the wedding was a year away, and although we would not be living together, at that moment, we were like husband and wife. And so, uh, the only way we would separate is through divorce. In fact, if I were to die during that year, then Mary would be my legal widow. And if either one of us were ever unfaithful, it would be a crime. Punishable by death. So, you can imagine my devastation in that year when, before we had come together as husband and wife on our wedding night, Mary was found to be with child. 
things were going so good between us. We were so happy. And I remember her coming to my wood shop, and she was in a panic, and she said, she said, I, I've, I've been visited by an angel, Gabriel, and, and, uh, and the angel has, has said that I will conceive and give birth to a son. And the conception will be by the Holy Spirit. Our son is to be the Messiah. Our son. All I heard her say was that she was pregnant and that I was to believe that, that it wasn't due to impurity. Can you imagine my confusion and my anger? And I was to be humiliated. What was I supposed to believe her? But I tell you this, that it did not matter at the time what I believed. Because I was a righteous man. You see, I would seek the scriptures. And the scriptures said that if an engaged woman were found not to be a virgin, she was to be stoned. Stoned. But thankfully the rabbis gave me another opportunity. They said, I could divorce Mary and I could handle it in one of two ways. I could first, I could first claim that, that Mary had committed adultery. And I could make a public announcement and let the Jewish law treat her as they would. Or, or I could could give Mary a letter of divorcement and through the lax laws of Jewish divorce I, I could simply say there was no reason, no crime I chose the latter I could not subject Mary to public disgrace so I divorced her quietly and now you can understand why my small town, my family and friends did not welcome me home. Because they believed that Mary deserved far, far worse. But I am here to say that that is not the end of the story. My family and friends would not listen, but I hope you will know that. I was about to make a horrible mistake, thinking I was following the will of God by divorcing Mary. But instead, he sent an angel to me in a dream. And talk about a dream. In the dream, the angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah! Oh... The angel said she will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. Not the family name. But Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And I tell you, waiting for that day to meet Jesus. The the infant king, and hold him in my arms, I often looked at my coarse, dry, rough hands, and I thought, how, how am I supposed to hold a prince of peace? How was I supposed to love a son that never was my own? But every day, God would remind me he loved me and Mary. And he loves each and every one of you. Thank you. So most of you are familiar with that story. It's a beautiful story, but when you look at it, what are you supposed to learn? What lessons are you supposed to walk away from a story like that uh, with? If you'll remember, again, in, in verse 22, 
Matthew said all this happened to fulfill what the prophet said. And then he said, they'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, I, I think one of the purposes of that story is to cause us to look at what happened and ask the question, what does the birth of Jesus tell us about the nature of God? God with us means God is seen in his son. So what does the birth of Jesus tell us about the nature of God? When I ask that question, I get at least three answers. One of the answers is this. God with us means God cares enough to change me. I mean, it's an incredible story. Joseph was a righteous man. His betrothed was found to be with child. And as a righteous man, his uh, ambition, his heart was to obey God. But he had a choice to make. According to Deuteronomy 22, uh, that divorce could look like stoning, public humiliation. It could also look like, according to the rabbis of the day, giving her a letter of dismissal, which was the kinder, gentler way to respond. The fascinating thing to, to me is uh, we all know that a couple of things lead to anger, a fear, frustration, and hurt. Typically, when a person suffers emotionally hurt, uh, emotional hurt, they respond with great anger. And so you would expect Joseph to follow the former, the harsher way. But Matthew says he doesn't. He desired to put her away quietly. How does that happen? Where does that kind of gentle disposition come from? That gentle disposition comes from the work of God in his life. That's the kind of thing God does. He takes people who are often harsh and mean, and he fills them with grace, transforms them into gentle people. That's what he did for Joseph, and that's what he will do for us. The God who is with us is a God who cares enough to transform us and to change us into people who are marked by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. I've watched him do the same thing in my life. So uh, growing up, there were no shortage of people who would tell me that because I was from a broken home, my marriage would be a disaster and my children would be a disaster. Um, but I remember uh, 2002 Thanksgiving, uh, Stacy and I had been married for eight years at the time. Uh, we had all three of our children at the time. And we went to Atlanta, Georgia to have Thanksgiving with my mom. So we spent the week with my mom. Uh, she watched Stacy and I interact with each other. She watched us interact with our children. At the end of the week, my mom, who was very slow to give compliments, said this. She said, you know, I'm amazed and how good of a marriage you have, and how good relationship you and Stacy have with your kids. And the reason that's so amazing was because you never had a good model. You know, she's kind of shaking her head going, how did that happen? And I knew how it happened. It's because of the work of God. He takes a, a guy who should not have a great marriage and gives him a great marriage. Transform me, transforms my wife, transforms us into parents who really know how to love our kids, that's the work of God. The God who is with us cares enough to change us. I wonder if some of you here this morning are struggling with some kind of habit, some kind of disposition, some kind of character flaw that you long to change. You long to be different. One of the messages of Christmas is God is with us. And the God who is with us cares enough to change us. Not only to change us, but he cares enough to guide us. He cares enough to guide us. In this story, you see God using two different means to guide Joseph. Uh, on one hand, he uses a divine inspiration. So Joseph, you know, he's faced with this situation. What do you do? His answer to that question is you turn to the word of God, which is a right response. When we wonder what we should do, we need guidance. One of the things this story teaches us is that we turn to the Word. One of the reasons we turn to the Word, according to 2 Timothy 1.14, is the Word is a treasure. That's what Paul calls it. He calls the Bible a treasure. 
so valuable. The reason it's valuable is because it's the word of God that prescribes what human flourishing looks like. If you want to really flourish as a human, if you really want to live, you don't want to just exist, but you want to know abundant life, God says, that's why I've given you my word. If you'll follow the word of God, then that results in human flourishing. God guides through divine inspiration. But not only does God guide through divine inspiration, the story also teaches us that God guides through divine intervention. So in this story, Joseph is trying to obey God, trying to follow his word. What he didn't realize was in trying to follow God's word, he was actually stepping out of God's will. And that because not there, there wasn't a problem with God's word. He just didn't have all the information. So what does God do? God doesn't sit back and allow Joseph just to kind of fall on his face. Instead, he steps in, sends an angel in a dream to let Joseph know that he doesn't need to fear. He could take Mary as his wife because that which is in her is of the Holy Spirit. And he will do the same thing for you. The God who is with us means that he is the God who guides. So the interesting thing is this whole idea of somebody attempted to do God's will and then actually stepping out of God's will because they lacked all the information, is it unique to this story? Time and time again, in Scripture, somebody's trying to obey God, but in doing so, they're stepping out of the will of God, and so God intervenes. In fact, in Matthew chapter 2, God does it twice. Magi are trying to obey God, honor authority by coming back to Herod and telling him where Jesus is. God sends an angel, redirects those guys, divine intervention. Again, in Matthew chapter 2, uh, Joseph is in Egypt with Mary and Jesus. Uh, in obedience to God, he's coming back to Israel, very dangerous place. And so God speaks to him in a dream, intervenes, and sends him instead to Nazareth. The same thing happened to Paul in Acts chapter 16 and verse 6. I mean, Paul had heard you know, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. And so Paul is out sharing the gospel with the world. He desires to go to Asia. And uh, Acts 16, verse 6 says, God prevented him from going to Asia and instead sends him to Galatia. The, the point is, is that when people are trying to do God's will but are inadvertently stepping out of God's will, God will intervene and redirect them back into his will. He will do the same for you. Some of you are facing decisions, not knowing exactly what to do. What I would tell you is that you consult his word, and then you do what, by faith, you believe is his will, trusting that if in doing that you are stepping out of his will, he will, by grace, direct you back into his will. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Uh, do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Uh, God cares enough to change you. He cares enough to guide you. And then thirdly, God cares enough to save you. Joseph, you'll call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. The word, or the name Jesus, is the Old Testament word Jesus. Uh, Joshua, which means uh, God is salvation, which is exactly what Jesus would do. He would save his people from their sin. I find that a curious statement. Save his people from their sin. That, that prompts all kinds of questions in my mind. Uh, one of the questions it prompts is, why, why do I need to be delivered? Why do I need to be saved? Jesus will save his people from their sin, why do I need to be saved? And the answer is pretty simple. Paul said in Romans chapter 6 that the wages of sin is death. Because I have sinned, done things that are displeasing to God, Paul says I die. That word death is this Bible word that means separation from God. In other words, because I've sinned, I'm separated from God while I live. I can't have a relationship with him now. And I'm separated from him from all of eternity in hell. Worst news is the Bible teaches there's nothing I can do about that problem. 
can't do enough good deeds to bridge that gap created by my sin between me and God. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end still leads to death. That's why I need to be saved, because I'm a sinner, and there's nothing I can do about my sin. But there's a second question. He will save his people from their sin. The second question I have is, what did God, what did Jesus do to deliver me? He will save his people from their sin. So how did Jesus make deliverance possible? He did two things. According to this passage, the first thing Jesus did was he was born. You know, the passage makes a big deal out of the birth of Jesus Christ. Why is that significant? I think at least for three reasons. One, it's significant because it says a lot about the nature of Jesus. He was born of a virgin, conceived of a virgin, and that because he is eternal in nature. Being eternal, he needs no father, just a womb. So it says a lot about the nature of Christ. He's eternal. That he was born of a virgin also says a lot about his purity. So how could Jesus become a creature, a human, without taking on humans' sin nature and thus be impure? The Bible teaches that the sin nature, congratulations men, is passed down through the Father. Because Jesus had no father, he could maintain his purity. This story also says not only was he virgin born, but he was born. And that's significant because God cannot die. Only humans die. And so Jesus was veiled in human flesh so that he could die, which is the second thing he did to deliver us. He was born by necessity. He was born. And secondly, he died. He was hung on a cross, and there he paid for my sin. First Peter says he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. It was there that Jesus paid for the things that caused separation between me and and God. That's why I need a deliverer. That's how Jesus provided deliverance. But there's a third question, and that's how does all that become mine? What do I need to do in order to be delivered? Again, the angel says that Jesus will save his people from their sin. He doesn't say he will save all people from their sin. He says he will save his people from their sin. I want to become one of his so I can be saved. So how do you do that? How do you become one of his people? John answered that question in John chapter 1. John said, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. We are all creations of God. But we move from being a creation of God to being a child of God when we personally receive Christ. So if I want to be delivered, the way I do that is I see my sin, I see my Savior, and I trust Him as my Savior. That's what happened to me when I was 17 years old. Somebody shared this story with me, and I bowed my knee on that day, and I said, Lord, I am a great sinner. (laughs) You are a great Savior. And instead of trying to save myself, I want to trust you as my Savior. That day, I was forgiven. That day, all my guilt was removed, and the whole trajectory of my life changed. That, not because I'm a great person, but because I have a great Savior, which is what God with us means. It means not only does God guide us and God change us, it means that God saves us. So, um... There was a lady who, like a lot of you, was hosting a Christmas party at her house. Uh, part of the Christmas party was a white elephant gift exchange. So, uh, you know, the ladies were exchanging gifts. Tenth person to open their gift. When that lady opened her gift, the hostess was a little surprised at what she pulled out. She pulled out um, the uh, baby figure from a nativity set. And the reason that surprised the hostess is it looked eerily similar to the nativity scene that they had in their front living room. So she wondered, she kind of slipped away, went into the front living room. Sure enough, the baby from their uh, nativity scene was missing. So she went back into the room where all the ladies were opening presents. She told them what happened. They all had a good laugh. 
the lady telling the story said, I have never forgotten that moment. Because in all the conversation, all the relating that was going on in that room, we had forgotten what the moment was really about until the lady pulled from the bag the baby Jesus. Uh, she said, I've never forgotten that moment because it's, be it's become instructive to me to remember that Christmas is all about the birth of Jesus, which is the point of the story that we uh, looked at this morning. Uh, God wants us to remember that Christmas is about the birth of his son. He doesn't want us uh, saying, I don't know who's responsible for this Christmas thing. He wants us to remember this is all about Jesus. And one of the things it's about, Jesus, is it's God with us. In Jesus we see we have a God who loves us, who wants to change us, wants to guide us, and wants to save us. God with us. Would you pray with me?